Hi, today we have come to Gladstone Pottery Museum in Stoke-on-Trent. We will see you inside the Gladstone Pottery Museum in a minute. This would be where the workers used to come in and they'd clock on here. This is here, it's a grade two listed building. So that's where they'd go in and they'd clock on in there. This is a steam engine that would power all of the machines in the pottery. You can smell the oil. So this is the slip house. So this is where the clay was prepared. Where they've made the bone china, which it says is made up from 50% bone, 25% china stone, and 25% china clay. So next, we're going to something about how people worked and what it was like to work in a pot bank. So here, we've got the sort of people who worked in a pot bank. So it says here's some of the names of people doing different jobs in the factory. So there's carter, stableman, clay carriers, slip makers, millman, pugman, saga makers, saga makers, bottom knocker, jiggers, jolliers, throwers, turners, pressers, casters, felters, sponges, cup makers, handlers, towers, mould runners, board carrier, attendants, one-legged dancer, mould maker, lodge keeper, cod placer, placers, Firemen, drawers, bedders, blacksmith, carpenter, boilerman, directors, managers, office staff, commercial traveller, printers, thimble pickers, dippers, gilders, artists, lithographers, ground layers, hand paintresses, crate makers, warehousemen, and packers. Now let's see if we can read those backwards. No. This is where the saggers were made. Saggers were used to support the pottery and protect it from smoke in the kiln each lasted about 40 firings so the saga maker needed to replace them continuously saggers were made by a team a skilled saga maker a frame filler and a saga maker's bottom knocker what a fabulous job title what do you do saga maker's bottom knocker this is where pottery's thrown hi so this is where they make it look easy and you think, yeah, I could do that. That looks dead easy, that does. But in reality, it would, pr difficult. it would probably look like crap if I did it. A lot of practice, yeah. What is it you're making? Uh, we're just trying, probably trying jug at the moment. Oh, OK. Uh, really easy when you watch somebody else do it who knows what they're doing. By any skill really, the more you see someone do it, the more you do it the better you get. Make into a jug and make a lip on it. The lips are quite the fingers. It's past the rim. Makes a flat area to start with. Makes a thin lip. Alright. Then we shake it out through the fingers. Wow, a jug. 
can you well, tell what that is at all? Uh, when it gets a bit drier, just take your hands off. Well, wow. one chug. Jiggering and jollying. So, this is the jigger that is used to make plates. This is the jolly that makes bowls, and the person who operates it is the jollier. They do look pretty similar, yeah. This is casting. This is slip casting. I make ornaments with slip. It's effectively rain and water mixed together. Yeah. It's got a few chemicals in there. You pour it into the mould. The mould's made of plaster of Paris. I'm guessing if it has chemicals, you're having to wear gloves, correct? No, no. No. That's not right, no. No. Um, the chemicals that we add to it is sodium silicate and soda ash, <laughs> which is effectively seaweed and sand. Oh, you can go to the beach and find this. Now, if you want to touch it, you can. It's okay. the slip I've just poured into the mould. There you go. Oops. Now, if you just touch inside, that's how it feels when it's just first poured. And this is the plaster mould, if you turn your hand just slightly. That's the plaster. Yeah, so, yeah, so, 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 so this is the plaster. That's the mould, it's made of plaster of Paris. And wow. then inside's the liquid clay, which is called slip. That's right. And now it's got water in it. Now, because the mould's made of plaster, it's like a sponge. It'll take water out of the mixture and starts to dry the clay. If you put your hand back again, it's almost, it's just starting to do it. Do you mind if I touch your hand? If you just curl your fingers a little bit, can you feel how that's starting to dry on the side? No, yes, if uh, it, that's uh, what you want. It, uh, it kind of fe it kind of feels like the soft uh, like the soft plato in the in the previous room, but yes. you can feel it it's a bit drier though. That's right, yeah, and it dries very very quickly because plaster's like a sponge, so it takes the water out of the mixture very very quickly. After 20 minutes, that skin of clay should be the right thickness. At that point, we then turn the mould over, as I'm going to do with this one. Just drain the fluid that's left over in the centre, because it doesn't use all the fluid. And then that's what you end up with. I'll just drain it. Like that. So you've got the thickness there. It's a bit messy, but... You get the idea. It's I do get the idea, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what you end up with. But what we have to do is let it drain for a while, and then it's about an hour afterwards we can get it out of the mould because it has to shrink away. But when they first come out, we have to let them dry a bit because they're too soft to work on. Now, if you feel that, that's a pot, it's vase. Now, can you feel the rough edge? Not a join line, it's only on the surface. And what that is, is what we call flash. It's where the two halves of the mould meet in the centre, where they split down the middle. Okay, so you do what we call feckling. We have to remove that line with a sharp feckling knife, and you feckle that away until you reach the vase. And that's the difference. If you feel that now, there's the, the ridge on that side. That's the smooth bit. That's where I've taken it away. Wow. And if you feel up there, there's still a little bit left to do. Yep, right there, which is right there. Yeah, yeah, that's it. We sponge it. The opposite way to feckling because you're closing the pores in the clay. And that gives you a nicer, smoother finish altogether. So if you feel the smooth bit, that's where I've sponged it. You can see the difference it makes. Oh, it make, that makes a huge difference. And then when I've completed that, when I've finished it, I'll give it three days to dry, then I pop it in the kiln and fire it. But I normally only fire it to the biscuit wear stage, which is the ceramic stage, really. And then I pop them over to the decorating shop, because these little items are used for what we call have a go painting. Okay. So you can paint a pot and take it home on the day. Okay. So they don't really need any further firing. No. So this is flower making. Quite a delicate job there. And we've got some more here. Mm -hmm. Some flowers. This is known as the greenhouse and dipping. So this is where they were dipped. It says following the biscuit firing. The dippers submerged each pot piece of pottery by hand in liquid glaze until covered in an even coat. When glossed fired, that's the second firing, it gives a smooth, glassy, watertight surface. And here we're coming through 
to the biscuit bottle oven. You can see everything stacked up inside. Yeah, which goes all the way up there. This is where all the saggers are stacked so that the pottery can be biscuit fired, which is the first firing after they've been made. And imagine children used to climb in here and stack them and they used to carry these things on their heads. Wow. Right, next one is the glossed bottle oven. Remember, the glossed firing was after oh, it had glazed. Imagine so, what it must have been like to work in here, in a bottle oven, where it was always warm or hot inside. Maybe you're a placer like this man. You fill the saggers with pottery, carry them into the oven on your head, and climb a ladder called the hoss to stack them. The saggers are extremely heavy, and you'll need more than 2,000 to fill this oven. You have to work fast, too slow, and you'll lose your job. This is the glossed placing shop. So, after being dipped in glaze, pottery was taken to the glossed painting shop to be put in saggers. This is the decorating shop here. There's a lady there decorating flowers. Hello. Come in. you can feel the and do be careful because they are quite sharp. Oh, okay. Okay, love, Barry, and they're quite heavy too. Can you manage that? Yeah. Hold that. Assemble the bowls in the clay stage when the flowers have all been made in the clay stage. Then they are biscuit fired in the bowl. Then they are dipped in glaze in, in the bowl <coughs> when they've been assembled, this is. And then they come into us glazed white and then we paint them in the bowl. We've got quite a few different talented people on here as well. Um, and then in here we do all the aspects of decorating ware. So it has got a peculiar smell in here as well. I don't know if you're picking up that smell. Yes. 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 It's a bit like Vicks. It, it, very much so, right? Now then, in here we do all the aspects of decorating ware and we work on the glazed ware, like I've just said. We use metal oxide powder colours that come to us in a powdered form and then we mix them, usually, with turpentine and fat oil into something like you've got on the tile to work with. I say usually. If we're doing a large area, like a, a figure or a vase, um, like my friend's working on, all freehand, no guidelines, no transfers on there, or if we're doing the big bottle ovens, anything large, we don't use the turps to mix the colours with. It, okay. It dries up far too quickly ah. because it's actually evaporating as you're working with yeah. it. So we use cloves or aniseed oil to mix the colours with to do that. And that's the, co the uh, smell. That's the smell, yeah. Ah. Right. Lots of children come in and say it smells like a sweet shop. Um, <laughs> um, usually Harry Bowes. <laughs> and lots of adults come in and say it smells like the dentist. They used to use clove oil for putting on your teeth. That's when right, they did, didn't they? Years they? Ago. Yeah. Some people tell me they still do. Um, but we've changed nothing. Why change something if it's working? Yeah, well, it's exactly. broke, don't fix it. Exactly it's worked right. for hundreds of years. So. That's right, it has. I've been in the industry most of my life um, and I've done all sorts of decorating wear, but it's always being decorated. Yeah. So a decorator doesn't make the flowers or um, make the ware, usually. A decorator is a decorator, flower maker is a flower maker. I was trained by Colport for two years to, to paint flower bowls, cottages, figurines and yeah. jewellery. And after two years they said I've made the grade and I could go piecework. Do you know what piecework is? Uh, what you is get piecework? paid per piece. Oh. That's right. So the more you do, the, the more, more you get. you get. Yeah. I was doing 40 complete pieces a day of the bowls yeah. of flowers. And I did that for 13 years piecework for Coalport. Um, I only left them to have a family. I've done 22 years in the industry altogether, mm -hmm. uh, piecework that is, plus five years working piecework from my garden shed as a home worker. 
as lots of mums did in them days. And I've done 14 years here, but not piecework. So I think I know what I'm doing now. Yeah. And there were 60,000 people working in the pottery industry in Stoke-on-Trent alone. Wow. I think we've got about six, six and a half thousand. It's a shame because it's a, it's a real we're scale. We're having a revival. Good. We're coming back. Yeah. So that's great. That's what you, we want. You, you can't do. beat the quality, can you? No, you, no, can't. you really cannot. Because it's just been passed down from generation right. to generation. That's right. Yeah. And people are learning now that if it's not made and painted here, they don't want hey, We have another bottle oven here. We'll just go inside. It's a long way up. I would have hated to have been on a ladder with a big heavy sagger on my head, climbing up just to fill this bottle oven. And the heat must have been oh, unbearable. Wow. So if we go around this way, we've got lots of saggers lined up to go in the oven. So this is just a, a little thing that's celebrating the last bottle oven firing that took place in 1978 in Stoke-on-Trent, put together by the people who did it. So don't use bottle oven firing anymore because of something called the Clean Air Act. So we don't have black smoke billowing out everywhere now. Here's some of the items that were made to celebrate the last firing in a traditional bottle oven. There we go, there's the photograph of the people involved in the last bottle oven firing in 1978. So we're in the bottom of another bottle oven and here we can see a depiction of the coals. It's only the light from the flames that gives any light in here otherwise it is completely pitch black. So this room is the mold maker so if you remember earlier speaking to that lady who told us about pouring the slip into the mold that was made of plaster of Paris yes. so this is where they made those molds so the shelves and shelves full of them. So they hear all these plaster of Paris molds. So this is the colour gallery and printing. We've got a room here. It was rooms like this that chemists used to experiment with different elements to produce different colours to put onto the pottery. Rooms like this that people prepared real gold. The machine's mixing gold with oil so it can be applied to pottery. Gold was only given to workers in small amounts in the white gilder shells you can see here. So if you look there, some very small shells. And you notice that there's bars at the window as well. Probably because of the gold. And over here we've got an example of a sugar bowl, cup, saucer and side plate that made from bone china and hand gilded from the 1840s. Oh. The sugar bowl was, the cup, saucer and side plate were made in 1877. So we've got a hot table here that was used, steam was used to heat the table to warm the ink and the copper plate and the ink and the copper plate needed to be warm in order to print the transfer paper. In here we've got pots full of different colours. So there's lots of different colours. Tons and tons of colours. Yeah, pretty much. So in here we've got the office from 1910 with the old-fashioned typewriter another part of the office so here's like the kind of showroom that they'd have in the office so that traveling salesmen could come and have a look at what they got and they could make the brochures up to take around to sell to people back outside again in the cobbled yard 
very Victorian and we're walking around to the doctor's house. Please wipe your boots before entering. So if we go around to the left here, this is the waiting room. Please refrain from spitting. Nice oh. carpet here. That's a rug. So upstairs, there would be where the doctor would live. You can see his wife's sewing machine at the top of the stairs. Well, I don't know where I can. Where do you wash me out? Do you use a nail brush? No, doctor, I don't do that. Well, I this is the doctor's down. office. Put your arms out in front of you. And your implements of torture on the desk. Well, you'll have to come out of oh, the implements of torture. Because they look painful. And then in here, this would have been the kitchen. So you've got the old fashioned range and the fireplace where his wife would have done the cooking. Kettles there, the irons there, pots and pans there. Would you like to have done your ironing? Would no, you I wouldn't. Iron? I wouldn't like a kitchen like this. Drying some clothes. There's a washboard there with the single cold tap. And here's the table. And there's the iron on the table. So if we come in here, this is. The enamel kiln. This is the decorating kiln. So it's quite a bit smaller than the big bottle ovens. And you can see the decorated ware in there cups, saucers, plates. On the roof up there, we've got some examples of different chimney pots. We've got medieval tiles. Islamic tiles and tin glazed tiles. Got the Gothic Revival. Got Minton tiles. So we've got on the floor here, we've got different examples of floor tiles that were used. It's a tiled mural. We've got tiled fireplaces. We do have one of those in our living room. Not that small though. And a very ornate one there. And we've got some examples of Art Nouveau tiles. Want some there with some very cute little dogs on. Tiles in the 70s. Okay, this bit's called Flushed with Success and it's toilets through the ages with authentic smells. Oh my gosh. It smells like a pigsty. The slums, slum kitchen. So there's the kitchen table with whatever mush it is they're eating on the plates. We've got the washing line strung across the room. Oh, and there's the bottle ovens. Oh, it's, the, the smell is awful. And the sky would have been black with smoke, which is probably why it's so dark in here, to just show what it was like until the Clean Air Act. Okay, here we have the first flush toilet as used by Queen Elizabeth I and this is from 1594 when Sir John Harrington invented a flushing toilet. Queen Elizabeth I was so impressed, she was his godmother, that she ordered Daddy. one for Richmond Palace. And now it seems somebody's just emptied their chamber pot over our head from the upper window. Look at that, and you can even see the yellow stains down the wall. Oh, they're very authentic. This is the tipper one. Tipper closet that recycled water from kitchen tanks, sinks even. Then we've got another flushing toilet. It's a bit grand. Got some examples of ceramic bowls. There's a highly decorated one. Why would you want a toilet bowl so decorated when you're just going to... I was going to ask that question. And here again we've got some really highly moulded toilets. These ones aren't behind glass, John, so you can have a feel. It is. Wow, that's really decorated. Moulded. Pull and let go. 
cisterns high, cisterns high and low. In the 1890s, most cisterns were mounted high above the toilet to achieve a good strong flush. The force of the water had to be strong enough to wash the toilet bowl and flush everything into the drain. High level cisterns could use up to three gallons of water per flush. So here we have bathrooms. So some of these basins are very highly decorated. And then in the 60s, this of avocado suite came out, which is an absolutely horrendous colour. When we moved into our current house, it had an avocado suite. That was uh, one of the first things to go. It's a very old fashioned bath. And that's a, a tiny bath. You're going to sit in it and turn the taps on and just sort of sit there with your legs hanging over the edge. There's a traditional tin bath. And there's a squat toilet. Here's a collection of toilet tat, <laughs> as they call it. So we've got um, a toilet brush that's stored in a holder that looks like a toilet bowl. Got miniature toilets. A phone holder that looks like a toilet. A toilet that's got hands in it, looks like a monster's climbing out. Gosh, yes, it is toilet tat. Collection of wooden toilets in different sizes. And here we've got different names for toilets and privies, back house, bathroom. Bog, boggy at the bottom, cloakroom, clothes stool, closet, comfort room, crapper. <laughs> right, we've had our trip around Gladstone Pottery Museum. Fortunately, it's a bit wet outside, but it's a great tour and John got to feel so much stuff and the, the level the, of interactivity and here you can touch this and you we'll can touch this, this and, the, and there's really a lot of explaining and it's really good definitely come again well worth a visit and so interesting to see how pottery is made anyway thanks for joining us if you like this video please give us a thumbs up and please subscribe if you don't already and we'll see you next time bye